Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing antithrombin-3 and heparin. Okay, so, um, we have now seen the intrinsic coagulation cascade by which uh, you can activate uh, the conversion of fibrinogen, or factor 1, which is a normal constituent of the blood, into fibrin, or factor 1A, which can then be assembled into fibrin strands, which will be deposited within uh, the platelet aggregate to form a stronger structure known as a secondary hemostatic plug. Okay, right. So now what we want to see is the other coagulation cascade by which uh, you can activate uh, the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin and therefore the deposition of fibrin strands. So let me get another piece of paper. So this one is not activated by collagen. Instead, this cascade, which is known as the extrinsic coagulation cascade, now it also has other names, uh, the extrinsic cascade is the old name for it. Um, the more modern name for it is the tissue factor pathway. Okay, so I'll just put that in. And it's quite an appropriate name, in fact, because uh, it is activated by tissue factor. And the extrinsic pathway is an odd name for it in the first place. Okay, so the tissue factor pathway. So both of these names, however, you will still hear used. Okay, so here's the tissue factor pathway. And here is extrinsic coagulation cascade. Okay, so it's activated by tissue factor. So let me draw my picture of a blood vessel with a great big hole in the side of it again. Okay, so here is the blood vessel wall here, which has now been cut in two, and we've got this hole coming out the side of it. Okay, now this means that blood is going to be able to leak out of... Um, that hole, and we've seen that when the platelets come into contact with all the new array of molecules and of cells within this um, exposed blood vessel wall, what's going to happen is they're going to stick to it and then be activated to aggregate, and you'll get a platelet aggregate forming in here. We've also seen the intrinsic coagulation cascade, where factor 12, or Hageman factor, will be activated to um, factor 12A um, by, um, by collagen that will be exposed uh, on the edges of this blood vessel here. Okay, so, uh, the extrinsic cascade, again, what's going to happen is that certain proteins that are within the blood are going to meet new proteins that are um, now exposed to it. So remember, usually, the constituents of the blood, all they see is the other constituents of the blood, and they also see the endothelial cells of the blood, they, or, well, of the blood vessels. They do not see anything else. Now, suddenly, they've got a whole new array of things that they're exposed to. Now, they are exposed now to peripheral cells. So let's say we've got a peripheral cell in here. And you know, it could be a smooth muscle cell in the wall of this blood vessel. It could be a fibroblast. There are loads of possible cells that this could be. Now, on peripheral cells of the body, you have a certain protein, basically, that is not expressed on the apical surfaces of the endothelial cells, and it's certainly not expressed on any of the uh, cells within the bloodstream. Okay, so this is a protein that the usual constituents of the blood do not ever see, and for good reason, because it's going to activate the coagulation cascade. So, this cell here is going to have a certain protein on its surface. So that lump that I've drawn off the side, this is supposed to be a certain protein. And this protein is called tissue factor. Now, tissue factor is its common name now. However, just like um, fibrinogen and prothrombin, tissue factor had an old name, and it was one of the coagulation factors. So the uh, old name for tissue factor is factor three. So now you won't worry about what fact, why there is no factor three. Okay, so tissue factor is factor three. Okay, so what's now going to happen is that one of the coagulation factors from the blood is going to come in here when the blood comes out this hole, and it's going to meet tissue factor, and it's going to be activated by tissue factor. And tissue factor is an unusual 
for the coagulation factors because it doesn't have an inactive and an active state. It's always activated. So this factor 3 is always capable of converting 7 to 7a. What's stopping it from converting 7 to 7a, and that's the one it's going to activate, by the way. Sorry, I didn't mention that. I uh, will in a moment. Okay. What's stopping it usually from activating 7 to 7a is that it never sees factor 7 because factor 7 is usually kept within the blood vessel, okay? So it will never ever see factor 3. However, once you've got this hole, what's going to happen is that factor 7 is going to meet tissue factor and it's going to be converted from the inactive form which is circulating in all of our blood uh, into 7a. Okay, right. So now what does 7a do? Well, it now activates another coagulation factor and you'll be relieved to know that it activates factor 10. So you can probably guess what's going to happen now because it's the same as the intrinsic cascade from here on. So it's going to activate factor 10 within the blood to factor 10a. So remember that factor 9a with um, its cofactor factor 8a activated factor 10 to 10a in the, um, where is it, here, in the intrinsic pathway. So it's exactly the same uh, from here on, but I'll just remind you of it anyway. Okay, so what we're going to do is factor 7a is going to convert factor 10, another coagulation factor circulating in the blood, to 10a, and then 10a along with its cofactor 5a, so along with 5a, is then going to convert uh, prothrombin into thrombin, or factor 2 into factor 2a. Okay, so let's show this. So you're going to get prothrombin, the old name for which is factor 2, Okay, being converted into thrombin, uh, the old name for which is 2a. Okay, and then we know what thrombin is going to do. Firstly, we know that it's going to lead to the production of more uh, factor 5a, which is going to lead to the positive feedback within this pathway. So you're going to get the positive feedback through factor 5a amplification. And also, importantly, thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen into fibrin. So I'm going to have to draw this going this way. Okay, and I'm going to have to move this over so I can squash the word fibrinogen in here. Fibrinogen. Okay, and remember the old name for fibrinogen is 1. Okay, factor 1. And uh, it's going to convert it firstly into fibrin, which is the active form of the factor 1 protein. And then fibrin is going to be polymerized into fibrin strands okay, by another enzyme which is within the blood known as factor 13a. St what have I missed out? Strands. Fibrin strands. That's better. Okay, and this conversion is done by 13a. So this is another way that you can produce these fibrin strands, basically. And this will again be happening in this hole here. So where you're getting the plate that's aggregating to make a primary plate that plug, in amongst all of that, you will be having uh, fibrin, uh, well, fibrinogen, being converted into fibrin strands. So you'll get fibrin deposition all over the place, and you'll form this spider's web of protein which is holding the platelets all together and making us this strong secondary hemostatic plug which will uh, plug in that uh, hole in the side of the blood vessel. Okay, now this is all healthy stuff. This is what's supposed to happen if you uh, get a hole in the side of your blood vessel. However, what we now need to talk about before we talk about antifrombin 3, we need the motivation which is that what if this all goes wrong? What if this pathway is activated inappropriately? Well, if this pathway is activated inappropriately, what you can get is thrombosis. So thrombosis is the result of the hemostatic pathway being activated inappropriately. Okay, so what you'll have is a blood vessel which has no hole in it. Okay, so this is a blood vessel that has no hole in it. And then what can start to happen is that despite this, um, what can start to happen is that platelets can adhere to the endothelial cells, okay? So here are some platelets 
adhering to endothelial cells. And you might ask, well, why on earth are they adhering to the endothelial cells? Surely they should not be adhering to endothelial cells. And you're right, they shouldn't. So generally, there has to be something wrong with these endothelial cells. They have to be diseased in some way. And one of the common causes of um, thrombosis, of plate that's starting to adhere to endothelial cells, is if, for instance, you had an atherosclerotic plaque here. So let's draw that here. So in atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis is a disease involving inflammation of the tunica intima and it causes all sorts of dysfunction within the endothelial cells. Okay, so we'll say that this is our atherosclerotic plaque. Okay, so when you've got an atherosclerotic plaque, this inflammation of the tunica intima, what this can do is it can lead to platelets starting to adhere to the endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells express all sorts of molecules that they shouldn't, and the platelets start to adhere to them, basically. The platelets then undergo activation, okay, and uh, this will start to lead them to aggregate, so they'll start aggregating, so you'll get a uh, platelet aggregate forming in the middle of this blood vessel, and then even worse, you can start to get the coagulation cascades activated. So the coagulation cascades will be activated and you'll get um, fibrin deposited in amongst these platelets. Okay, And this structure that you've formed, this, uh, well, it's the same sort of structure as you would have in a secondary hemostatic plug. However, it's not actually plugging the hole in any artery. This is not, well, in any arteriole or any blood vessel at all. Instead, it's just forming in the lumen of the blood vessel. This is what's known as a thrombus. Okay, and this is not good. Okay, so if these thrombi form within blood vessels which supply the heart or the brain, okay, specifically the two most vital organs of the body, the heart and the brain, then what will happen is you'll occlude blood flowing to those um, or, well, portions of those organs. And if you don't have blood flowing to cells, then they won't be getting oxygen or glucose delivered to them. And oxygen's the main problem. If you don't get oxygen delivered to cells, uh, for if that uh, occurs for a long enough period, then the cells will start to die. Okay, And when portions of the heart die, that's known as a heart attack or a myocardial infarction is the uh, proper name for a heart attack. And if it happens in the brain, then it's called a cerebrovascular accident, or a CVA, and a stroke is the more um, pervasive term for a cerebrovascular accident. So if you survive myocardial infarctions and um, strokes, and they are often fatal, uh, then the stroke will lead to um, huge sort of, well, it can lead to motor deficits, it can lead to sensory deficits, it can lead to cognitive deficits, etc. It's going to cause dysfunction of the brain, basically. Um, and if you have a heart attack and you survive a heart attack, then you end up with huge portions of the heart, which are just dead, basically, and are no longer um, going to actually contract. So. The thing about the heart and the brain is that after you are born, there is pretty much no cell division in either of them. So the cells that you have within the brain and your heart, you have had pretty much, the rule generally is that you've had them since birth. It's not quite true. There will be some cells that have divided since you've been born, but it's ridiculously low that you can pretty much ignore it. So the general rule is that the heart and the brain do not have any cell division in. It's not quite true, and there's loads of research coming out explaining the importance of, um, for instance, cell division in the hippocampus and things like that in the brain, and there is also a bit of cell division in the heart. But the general rule is that you have very little in these two organs, which I find, for one, I find quite Un, well, unusual, because, you know, they're the most important organs of the body, and yet they're incapable of repairing themselves. And this is why bits of the heart and the brain dying is so serious, because you once they're dead, you can't replace them. So, for instance, if you survive 
portions of the heart and the brain dying. They'll just be replaced by other cells, basically. They won't be replaced by uh, neurons. Okay, so in the heart, it's most definitely replaced just with connective tissue. So a huge bit of the muscle dies, it's just replaced with connective tissue, which isn't contractile. So you lose a huge portion of your heart muscle that is no longer capable of contracting. Now, if you think about this, if you've lost a huge amount of your heart muscle, so let me draw a little picture of the heart, okay? So here is um, the right atrium. Here is the right ventricle with the pulmonary trunk coming out here. Here is the left ventricle. Here is the left atrium and then the massive great aorta coming out of the left ventricle. So let me just label things up. Right atrium, RA. Right ventricle, RV. Left ventricle, LV. Left atrium, LA. Right, so if we imagine that a huge great portion of our left ventricle has died, okay, and it's been replaced just with a scar, it's been replaced with connective tissue, then this portion now is not capable of contracting. So do you think you're going to be able to expel as much blood out of the left ventricle? No. Basically, the left ventricle will start to fail. It will start, it's become much weaker, okay? So it will struggle to expel blood into the aorta. It will have a much more difficult time. Now, that means that the other cells of the left ventricle are going to have to work harder. And how can they work harder? How can they increase their strength? Well, basically, what starts to happen is they start to undergo a process known as hypertrophy. So, the heart, as I've told you, cannot undergo cell division. The cells of the heart can't divide. So you can't make more heart cells, but you can still grow the heart. There is a way to grow the heart. So there are two forms of growth, basically. If you want to grow an organ, so let's say our organ consists of four cells here, which is obviously an oversimplification, but for the picture it will work. There are two ways that we can grow this organ. Either we can divide the cells, Okay, so we can make the cells divide and make more cells so that we've now got an overall bigger organ here. Or what you can do is you can make every single cell actually grow itself so all the cells can become bigger. And that will also lead to the growth of the organ. Okay, so there are these two different mechanisms of growth. This approach where you cause the cells to divide is known as hyperplasia. Okay, or hyperplasic growth. And this approach, where you actually make each cell get bigger, this is known as hypertrophy. Okay, so the heart cannot use hyperplasia, so instead it has to use hypertrophy. So what happens is all the other cells of the heart start to enlarge. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And this temporarily makes them stronger. They get bigger and they, their ability to contract gets greater. So... Initially, it solves the problem. The heart has come up with a way of making up for the fact that it's lost a huge uh, amount of contractile uh, cells from it. Okay, the problem is these larger, these hypertrophy cardiomyocytes gradually lose the will to live. Uh, so even though they temporarily become stronger, over time they just decay and decay and decay and they become weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Okay, and they actually get weaker than they were before they underwent the hypertrophy. So, what gradually happens is more and more of the left ventricular cells undergo hypertrophy. It gives them a short-term benefit, but then gradually they just become useless over time. So, more and more of the heart cells become useless over time, and this just makes the left ventricular wall weaker and weaker and weaker as more of them undergo the hypertrophy process. And it's a vicious circle, basically. Once some of them have undergone hypertrophy and have become weaker as a result of it in the long term, that means that others are going to be induced to undergo hypertrophy because the heart's just going to struggle more and more to push the blood out. Uh, so basically you get this vicious cycle where more and more of them undergo hypertrophy and it just means that the left ventricle becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. It would have been better off just not undergoing the hypertrophy at all and we are trying to find what causes them to undergo hypertrophy to try and stop it. 
So gradually what happens is the heart becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And when it's so weak that it can't actually pump enough blood around the body in a minute to actually meet the needs of the body, we call that heart failure. And that will often be fatal. Okay, so that's what heart failure is. So if you do survive a myocardial infarction, you're then at risk of uh, going into heart failure. Okay, um, progressive heart failure. Okay, and if you survive uh, cerebrovascular accidents, as we've um, discussed, you um, often have um, um, cognitive or motor or sensory deficits of some sort. Okay, the other thing just to mention on the note of thrombosis is that what can happen is occasionally um, portions of a thrombus can break off so you, this great big portion here might just break off from the original site where it formed and then what you're going to get is this mass of platelets aggregated together and held together by fibrin strands which intertwine between uh, the platelets you're going to get this cast off into the bloodstream so what can happen is you can form thrombi and then they can throw off these particles, these large portions of the thrombus into the bloodstream and when you've got a moving motile portion of a thrombus this is known as an embolus okay specifically it's a thromboembolus so an embolus is just anything any sort of large particle moving around the bloodstream basically a thromboembolus is specifically a embolus which is made from a thrombus okay and we'll continue this video in uh, we'll continue this discussion in the next video Shh.